All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for attending the webinar this afternoon. Um, my name is Courtney Soderberg. I am the Statistical and Methodological Consultant at the Center for Open Science. Um, and today we have our first guest webinar speaker, uh, Alexander Etz from UC Irvine, as well as uh, part of the JAS group, um, which he's going to be telling us more about. Um, so today, as it says by the title of the webinar, we're going to be talking about using JASP for statistics, as well as how JASP and the OSF can talk to each other to make your analyses a little bit more reproducible. Um, I just wanted to quickly go over how you can ask questions. Um, in terms of after the webinar, you can also um, ask me questions or ask Alex questions as well. Um, so here are a few um, links for both JASP and the OSF as well as Twitter handles um, and emails, contact at cos.io if you have any questions about Center for Open Science or the Open Science Framework. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about JASP, you can either email Alex um, or you can tweet at them at JASPstats. All right, so I will hand it over to Alex for the rest of the webinar. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Um, today, I think I'll just go through a few short steps. Um, first, I'm just going to show off JASP a little bit, show you how to use it, show its nice features. Um, then I'm going to show you a little bit of the OSF. Um, I'm going to assume you can handle making your own account. I won't show you all of that uh, technical stuff. Um, then I'm going to just go through uh, how to sync all these things up to make your workflow a little bit easier. So first, let's just go into JASP here. So now you'll see that uh, we're into the JASP screen. I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger there. So this is the welcome window here. So you have your uh, version software here. Um, and now if you are not keeping your software up to date, they do keep rolling out updates. And so uh, you might get left behind a little bit there. Um, then we've got the file and common tabs here. The file tab is where you do all of your starting stuff. So uh, you can see here we've got our recent files, we've got our computer files, the OSF, eventually I'll show you how to do this. And then there are a few built-in examples which are kind of fun to play around with. Um, so I'm just gonna open up from my computer. I'm gonna go into my downloads folder and let's go to date modified here. There we go. So now that's all it takes to load the data. That's just a, a CSV file there. This can load in a few different types of data sets, um, CSV, text files. Uh, I think it can load in SPSS files in the latest release. Um, so now you've got your window here. This has all the rows, participant numbers, columns, um, conditions, all these different things. And so you scroll over, you can see more. If you want to see all of it at once, you can go like this. So. This has a lot of columns, but just a few are really of interest, so we'll just keep it smaller. So now we might want to see the descriptives of this, so we'll click descriptives up at the top. So this is where all of your action is going to happen. So we'll do descriptive statistics here, and now we're, we've collapsed the data into the left over here. We can make it go all the way away if we would like. Then we can go to Oh, maybe we'll see participant numbers. Well, there are 102 participants. Conditions. Uh, let's go to maybe the me whoops, the means. Uh, we can do some plots if we'd like, all this fun stuff. But we're just going to remove that for now. Now, for this data set, it's a t-test data set. So we're going to go into t-tests. And then we're going to go into this drop-down menu that just says independent samples t-test. So we click that. And now we're into the options panel here. 
Now the options panel is where you specify all of the little bits of your analysis. So um, for this data set, the dependent variable is the mean NEO. So we're gonna put the dependent variable here. Now we need to say what the grouping variable is. And in this, we're going to do rotation as the grouping variable. And so now you see that it just pops up into the table and it shows the T value, degrees of freedom, and the P value. And if you say, oh, well, I'm worried about uh, different variances, oh, well, then we're gonna say, uh, check a quality of variances. And we see here, non-significant test for equality of variances, which doesn't mean that they're equal, but it just means you might not worry too much. But we'll get rid of that. Now we could do the different uh, t-tests here. If we wanted to do um, a little bit more robust, we can add the man Whitney, and that just adds another row to our table. We'll take that off for now. We can also do is change our hypothesis. If we had a one-sided or uh, hypothesis either direction, we can click on these and it just automatically updates it. So now it has a little note that says, for all tests, the alternative is specifying that clock is greater than counter. So clockwise is greater than counterclockwise. But we'll change it back. And you notice that every time I press a button, it all changes immediately in the panel to the right. Now what we're gonna also show is the mean difference between the groups, so the raw mean difference, and that's gonna show up right here. And then we're gonna say, well, we also want the effect size. So now we have our Cohen's D effect size. And, oh, but now we also want a confidence interval. So now we have our confidence interval on our Cohen's D effect size. We could change that. Oh, we actually want 99%. Well, you just click 99% and press enter. And there you go, 99%. We can also do descriptives from here. And I'm going to show you just our plotting here. So we can do a descriptives plot. And that just does a standard dot plot. Um, I do believe they're um, adding more fun plots soon, which have um, like the scatter points sort of violin plot with the densities added around it, which are pretty cool. Um, but OK. so. This is just a general example of how you would do your analysis. So it's pretty quick, press OK, that goes away, now you're left with this. So if you wanted to, you could take this and copy it and paste it right into Word. So it's fully APA formatted, you don't have to worry about messing with it at all. Um, copy citations, if you do your analysis in JASP and you want to include it in your paper, uh, you would add the citations to the software using that button. So I think this is all a little uh, easy, I, I feel like, compared to, say, SPSS, where you have to go through, I think, four menus to do a t-test. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that when you do your t-test like this, if you say, oh, shoot, what I really wanted to do was a one-sided test but now I have just a two-sided test. So you would just click this again and go back in here and click group one greater than group two and hit okay. So it's really easy. Now I'm gonna show you how you might uh, go about using the OSF to store your data and show you why uh, using JASP and the OSF together will really um, make your workflow a lot easier. So let's close out of JASP. Um, let's don't save. And now I'm going to show you the OSF. So if I wanted to share my data using um, using the OSF in my paper, I would create a new project here from the dashboard and let's just call it um, fun things. So we 
kind of a couple of options, description, templates, but we're just gonna go blank. New project, go to project. Now, here we are in our project fun things. It's private, so no one can see this but me until I hit make public. And I'm just gonna go into the files tab here. And from my desktop, which you cannot see right now. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, we are going to go to, we're going to drag into here with our data set, kitchenrolls.csv. And you should be able to see here now that there's a CSV file loaded into our OSF page. So if we go back to the home page, you'll see that, okay, here we go, kitchen rolls. So now our data set is on there. Now you wanna share your data, you say, hey guys, we have this link to our OSF page. The data set is right on there. And then if you wanted to say, share with your collaborators, you could send them the link and keep it private. And then they would come in and they would click on it and they would download it themselves. And you would say, okay guys, I did a t-test and I used these settings and I did a one-sided with confidence intervals and all of these things. Um, but there's a way to do this that it's a little bit easier and there's less room for confusion and for different analysis is to be run on accident um, so that everybody isn't quite on the same page. So I'm going to show you how to access this file from JASP itself directly and then how to upload your analysis that you do in JASP straight to the OSF so that everybody else can see it and then um, use it on their own computer. So I'm gonna go back into JASP. So now you should be seeing JASP on the screen share. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go into the OSF tab in JASP. And you see that I've got my email here. Now I need to type in my password. So we hope it's correct. And it was, you never know. Um, now we're going to have all of our projects here that we have on our dashboard on the OSF. So you see, I just made fun things. So now I'm gonna click on fun things. And that brings me into my storage files. So now I'm gonna click OSF storage. And there you see my kitchen rules data set. Now I just double click on that and it loads it straight from the OSF. So that's pretty nice. Um, one of the nicer things about this is, um, is the ability to go straight from the OSF into JASP. Now we're gonna go to, back to our t-test. So we click on that from the top menu. We go rotation is our grouping variable mean again, and I'm just gonna go with that for now. Now we go to save as, and you see that we're, since we're in our OSF, we can save as straight to the OSF. So we're gonna save into our um, OSF folder for fun things. This will be just um, example. So we hit save and it pings it and says, please save this now. And now it's saved. So now if you see, you go back into file, into the save folders. Now you see there's example.jasp. JASP is the output, um, dot .jasp file type is the output of JASP. So 
This saves it directly to the OSF so there's not a copy on your computer. If you want to save a copy on your computer, you just save it to computer. And you would just name it here and click Save. So now I'm going to close this data set. And you go back to common, now it's gone, right? Now if I go back to my OSF page, refresh it. You see we've got an example dot jazz. So it uploads it right there. You say, oh no, but I meant to also include um, a different analysis. Well, you go back to jazz. You say file, open from my OSF, example.jas, double click. It loads the data and it loads all of your results. So you click on it, brings back up the menu, shows you all of the cool stuff there. Now you say, oh, I want my descriptives, you add your descriptives. Or I wanted effect size and confidence interval, and then you add those. Now, there's a neat little feature here that I'd like to show you where you can add notes to this. So I'm gonna click add notes. And now there's a text box here. So now I'm gonna put a little note that says, this is the primary result. Um, it shows a non-significant p-value. This was pre-registered. It wasn't this time, so that's a lie, but it was in, in your hypothet hypothetical paper. So you say, this was pre-registered. So now you click out. Now you submit your paper, you show them your JASP file, everything is in the open, and then somebody comes to you and says, ah, oh, well, you know your p-value there. That's not a significant p-value. So you can't really interpret that very well. And you say, yes, that's true, I guess. What should I do? They say, well, you can do a Bayesian test, which allows you to see if you have evidence for an absence or just the evidence of absence. So is it inconclusive or does it really support a null hypothesis? So now we go back into t-tests and I'll show you how to do that. We go to Bayesian independent samples t-test. And now that's just going to pop up down at the bottom here. So. We're gonna do the same settings as before, where we have our mean is our dependent variable. Then we have rotation as our grouping variable. And now it calculates a base factor. And that just pops right in there. So when you do this, you've got to realize that it has preset Bayesian settings. So if you're doing a test, and do you expect a large effect size, then you would use this Cauchy prior width. That just says roughly um, the, the rough guess of what you expect the population means to be in terms of Cohen's D, so the standardized values of um, the mean difference. Now, um, you get this default setting for various purposes, but you say, well, really, I expect a pretty small population effect size, maybe around Cohen's D of 0.3. So now you click 0.3 and you hit enter, and that changes the result. So um, you usually you don't have a good reason to pick a precise value, say 0.3, but you really could pick 0.1. Say, well, you could pick 0.1. There's no reason I couldn't pick that. But I also, you know, you could pick 0.25. There's no reason you couldn't pick that. But what you can do is click on this base factor robustness check option. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna show you how the base factor changes depending on the prior that you choose. So we're running, we're running, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna click this button just to switch so that it's on top instead of on bottom. Um, you can do it. There we go. So now we have this robustness check. 
So you say, we've got our user prior width, which is 0.25. So if we expected a small population effect size, then the evidence in favor of the null hypothesis, BF01, in favor of the null, is not very big. So this falls into the so-called anecdotal category. I prefer to just call these inconclusive. Um, so these are just rough guidelines. There's no real bright line here. But if you were to expect a very large population effect size, like say you were studying, oh, I don't know, an anchoring effect, which are shown to be fairly large effect sizes, and you say, I want to see if the some Southeast Asian population also shows anchoring effect sizes or something like that. Then you would expect probably a pretty big population effect size. And so if you did, then you would have a little bit stronger evidence in favor of the null because you actually found a pretty small effect size. So now you can add this and you can say, uh, add a note where you say, we expect a large of population effect size, so blah, 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 right? You can add your interpretations there, and then you click to get out of it. So now you want to push this back up to the OSF. All you got to do is go in here, click Save, and then click Save. There we go. Now I'm going to show you again on the OSF. So we go back here. Now we're back. We're going to reload it. And you see that the files have, again, up updated. So um, we're going to then, um, so now what we've done is we've We've, uh, instead of having to download the data set from the OSF, load it back into JAS, run the analysis ourselves, we've saved the JAS file onto the OSF where it can do version control and um, it makes for easy sharing. Now, one other very nice thing about integration with the OSF is that when these JAS files are on the OSF, you can click on them like so and it brings up a browser that shows all of the OSF results and all of your comments. So people don't actually have to have JASP installed on their own computer in order to see what's going on with your results. You can just send them this page. You see it's version two. If you wanted to see version one, you could do that. But we just say, no, nope, we want version two. So, um, You've got this here, and you can see all of the notes. So anybody who sees it, you can say, you could put the citation, you could put the link to the paper, um, you could do all these things, and then we have our t-test. We might have put a note that says, there's also a Bayesian t-test down below, but nonetheless, we have our Bayesian t-test, we have our plot here. Um, and so I think it's a pretty simple, use, right? You just, you do your analysis as you do. You link it to the OSF through JASP and it takes all the care of the rest all on its own. Um, I would like to show just one more thing before I wrap up here. So let's go back into JASP. Now we've, say you want to um, somehow your JASP file crashes or something goes terribly wrong and you're, you're, you can't access um, JASP or something like that. Well, if you have um, it on the OSF, of course, then that's safe. Um, but say it's on your computer. So let's save it just to downloads. Sample uh, exists. Well, let's replace it. So now I'm going to show you a neat little trick. So we'll go to the, our finder here. Now you see this, we have 
um, example.jasp in our folder. So if you were to double click on this, it would open it back up into Jasp. But say your Jasp broke or something. Well, what you can do is you can right click it and you can rename it. Where's the rename button? Hmm. Well, let's just do this. So we rename it here and instead of .jasp, we do .zip. So we save it. It says, are you sure you want to change this? You say yes. Now you double click it and you have access to all of your data, your analyses, your um, all the different metadata and things. You have, uh, what's in this folder? We have our, let's see. Oh yeah, that's our um, figures. So if you want, if you're, you're, you can't get in there, you've got to get your figures out. Those are saved in here as uh, PNGs. And um, if you were to double click on the index, I believe it would pull up that, um, the same thing you see on the OSF viewer. Um, now, let's see, what else can we do here? We've got a couple of minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions? I can also show just different analyses. If somebody has a question about like a correlation test or something, I'm happy to answer those, but I believe that's all I've got to show. Is there any way to script a set on analyses? Um, well, no, there's not. Um, so the way that JASP is set up is that it's, just a user interface that interacts with R. Um, so everything under the hood is R code. Um, uh, most of the Bayesian analyses are from the Bayes factor package. So, and I believe all of the main classical tests are just using the regular R functions. Um, and so if you wanted to do your own scripting analyses, you could get all the same results, but you'd have to do it in R yourself. Um, that's a really um, nice thing about JASP is that it's all sort of self-contained and it does, it makes sure that everything um, is all set for you. Um, but of course, you know, if you're at the point where you want to do custom analyses, then I, I think you're already a sort of um, more advanced than most users. And so um, you would sort of be on your own using R for that. But R is pretty easy too. I mean, it's not, not too bad. Alex, if people wanted to see exactly what R code was being run underneath um, the JASP calls, they can look at all of that on your all's GitHub repo, correct? Yes, you could. Yes. So all of the, so this is all open source. So anything that, um, you want to know how it works. It's all on GitHub. Um, that's also where you put the, if you have a bug report or if you've got a question or a feature request, um, that's the main, um, way to interact with, with the software developers. Now we've got Q and A teams and people on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, so um, there's another question here. Are we assuming anything like Gaussian distributions during Bayesian analyses? If so, is there any non-parametric version of these tests? Wow, what a great question. Um, we typically are assuming, so for a t-test, you're assuming that the uh, sampling distribution of the data are, is normal. Um, and there are not yet non-parametric versions of these tests, um, but those are in development, I can tell you. So one day they will be in there, um, but it's usually not as straightforward as the classical ones because you have this much more complicated uh, combination of robust sampling distributions and prior distributions and how do you sort of navigate between them is an open question. 
But yeah, so right now you should definitely know that, say for the correlation, they're assuming bivariate normal ANOVAs, they're assuming all the typical ANOVA things. Um, yeah, so yeah, good question though. So yeah, I mean, these are all, these all depend on assumptions just like all the regular tests that you normally do. All right, um, so if we don't have any other questions, um, right now thank you all so much uh, for attending if you end up thinking about questions later on either for myself um, or for alex and the jasp team um, you can always email us uh, for anything about the osf contact at cos.io is what you want um, and then for jasp um, the best way to get in touch with the jasp team is probably through their twitter handle which is at jasp stats um, or you can email alex at ats at uci.edu. Thank you all so much.